This is Curative Design, and I'm Arun Matthews. By now, it's possible that you've heard of a speech given by Lieutenant General Jay Silveria to the students of the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. It was given in response to a series of racist messages posted on a bulletin board in one of the student areas. I first happened upon it while checking my newsfeed one Friday mid-afternoon. I listened to it exactly one time and recall being at once completely moved. But then I also noticed that through the rest of the day and into the night, I was haunted by the general's words. Unsurprisingly, the video of the speech quickly turned viral and led me to ponder on what made his words so deeply moving to me, even though upon later discussion with my wife, we both agreed that the messages were quite simple. This is my attempt to explore why I found the speech so effective. First, some basics. The speech is 743 words long or about two double-spaced type pages in length with a font setting at 12. It is seven paragraphs and took approximately five minutes and 29 seconds to orate. As a general overview, it appears to be a masterclass in clear, concise communication. There is an efficiency of ideas at work here that William Strunk Jr. himself would have perhaps appreciated. The general's opening line dives directly into what happened and does something interesting. If you haven't heard that, I wanted you to hear it from me. If you haven't heard that, I wanted you to hear it from me. Already he's taking ownership of this communication and establishing his role as informer slash educator. He then launches directly into a central thesis. If you're outraged by those words, then you're in the right place. If you are outraged by these words, then you are in the right place. In two sentences, he has A, explained what transpired, B, established his authority, and C, level set the entire institution's moral expectation for the response. There is a simplicity of language here that makes the message even more powerful. He then goes on to lay the groundwork for his suggestion as to how to respond. And I'll tell you that the appropriate response for horrible language and horrible ideas, the appropriate response is a better idea. Before he details that idea, he does something remarkable and something that I don't often see in speeches. He literally rallies his leadership team around him. In an impressive power play, he commands his entire staff to step forward while naming various different echelons of leadership. This seems to illustrate how this idea that he's about to share is supported by the entire leadership staff at the Air Force Academy. And yet again, before sharing the idea, he takes a moment to tie this speech to the larger present-day landscape of politics and sentiment. He chooses not to speak in vagaries, but hones in on the specific cultural flashpoints of Ferguson, Charlottesville, and the protests in the NFL. The gloves have come off. Yes, this speech is political, and he, along with the now mobilized USAFA leadership, have chosen to own it and not shy away from the shackles of political correctness. It is only after these two things have been established does the general choose to share the idea. And it is not a particularly groundbreaking or new idea. The notion that we are stronger when multiple viewpoints, creeds, and cultures figure out a way through their differences and unite. It is the very notion of America. And yet, he keeps coming back to specifically addressing the 4,000 or so students in the room. And I wonder if the general feels that to the minds of our young people, this idea may in fact be a novel one and not something that generations of people struggle to achieve. It is as if he and the leadership of the USAFA recognize the sheer importance of taking an extremely visible moral stand against this act of racism. This is what our finest educators often do. He concludes with a variation of his opening thoughts, and some might argue that here is where the speech meanders into a darker paternalism, demonstrating an awareness of young people's close relationship with technology. He initially commands, and then, somewhat chastened by their lack of immediate response, 
invites them to record and share this moment with their devices. And that moment is his closing statement. If you can't treat someone with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. If you can't treat someone from another gender, whether that's a man or a woman, with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. If you demean someone in any way, then you need to get out. And if you can't treat someone from another race or a different color skin with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. Would I call this a great speech? Possibly, but not great in the way that alters the fabric of humanity, such as I have a dream, the Emancipation Proclamation, or ask not what you can do for your country. I do believe that it is an excellent speech, and its excellence lies in its clarity of purpose, the economy of words presenting powerful concepts and clear communication style. I also admired both the theatrics of moving the leadership team towards the students and the bravado of unapologetically acknowledging the current landscape of racial politics in America. Perhaps more important than the actual speech itself was the very decision to make this a teachable moment for the institution by mobilizing an all-hands assembly to discuss what some may have dismissed as kids just being mean to one another. This emphasizes a central belief about how we can impact the world with our responses to injustice as and when we see it. Thanks for listening. This has been Curative Design, and I'm Arun Matthews.